Hello, and welcome to the Kevin Mannix Report. I'm Kevin Mannix, and I'm your host for this program, which is designed to give all of us a little more input and information about what goes on in and about state government, both in Salem and throughout our state. Our guest today is a gentleman who knows much about the legislative process because he is right there at the heart of the legislative process. He is the legislative administrator, the person in charge of the committee process and staff support process, Dave Henderson of Salem. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, one of the things I just said was sort of a presumptuous comment on my part. I said, Dave Henderson of Salem, and then it occurred to me as I was saying it, you know, one of the things we do on the show is try to find out more about people, and I just realized I don't even know if you live in Salem or if you commute or whatever else. Where are you from now? Where do you live now? I do live in Salem. My wife and I live in West Salem, and uh, we've got three kids. And uh, my wife works at the Capitol, so we commute together to the Capitol every morning. Well, I'm glad I was right on my speculation on that point. You were right. Do we still have some folks who commute from Portland or Albany, Corvallis, Eugene, uh, working for government? We've got a number of people at the Capitol who commute from all over. There are uh, commuter buses that run down from Portland, that run up from Eugene. So there's a wide variety of people at the Capitol from, from all over the valley. Now, one of the things, as I mentioned, that we like to do is get a little bit of personal background information without being too pushy. And um, uh, tell us a little bit about the job that you're in right now, but then also what other kinds of jobs you've had in politics? Well, the job I'm in right now is as the legislative administrator for the, the uh, Oregon legislature, and I've been in this job for three years now. Um, I came to this job from a background in a variety of uh, political positions. I worked for uh, uh, Congressman Denny Smith when he was in office. Uh, following that, I worked for Dave Fronmeyer when he was running for governor. Um, I moved into the legislative branch uh, right after that campaign in 1990, and then I've worked in a couple of offices in the House of Representatives before I moved into this current position. Now, with that kind of background, it would sound like you have kind of connected up with what I call the, the administrative and staff support network for elected mm -hmm. officials. Uh, sometimes folks who do that then move on to the elected official trail themselves. Uh, have you ever thought about that aspect of it, or, or is there some particular part of this that you particularly like? Well, when I was growing up in Iowa, I talked with my father, and I told him that uh, my plan was to run for the legislature and ultimately be the governor of Iowa. Um, I moved away from Iowa, so I don't think that's going to happen. And then when I went through my first campaign on the staff side in 1980, I saw the demands that are placed on candidates and their families, and I decided that uh, being in the background and working in a support role rather than being in office was uh, a position that I would prefer. So no plans to run for office. Now, you mentioned you have a wife and three kids. Yes. Uh, I assume that's a factor, too, in terms of the demands on your time and, and uh, wanting to be able to have some time at least with family as opposed to being out on the campaign trail. It's a big factor, and as, as you well know, having run campaigns and having served in office, uh, the time demands on legislators are tremendous. Uh, I, families suffer because of the time that you have to put into doing your job, whether it's during a session or during a campaign. And uh, I admire the people who do run for office and serve in office because they are willing to give of themselves and uh, their families give up a lot and uh, I really respect the folks who are willing to do that. Now you mentioned you grew up in Iowa. Uh, did you graduate from high school there? Graduated from high school in Iowa and then uh, attended Iowa State University for a couple of years before I moved to Oregon. Now what brought you to Oregon? Well, some friends and I had, uh, were living together in, uh, in Ames and uh, had grown up in the Midwest and lived there all our lives. And uh, at 20 years old, we decided it was time to see something different. So uh, uh, we decided Oregon would be a good place to move to. And uh, we did that 19 years ago. And uh, I'm still here and have no plans of leaving. Did you go on to any further schooling in Oregon or had you already finished what you wanted to do in Iowa? I uh, attended Oregon State University and got my bachelor's degree in political science. And from that, I interned on my first campaign. And then that worked into a full-time position that I held for a while there. Now, you mentioned working uh, for former Congressman Denny Smith. Mm -hmm. um, how long did you work with him? I worked with Denny from his 1980 campaign uh, up until 1989 uh, when I moved on to the uh, Fronmeyer campaign. 
So there was a long haul working with Denny Smith. Long time working with Denny, and I worked my way up. Uh, I started out as his driver on his first campaign, so I've driven over much of uh, Oregon or flown over much of Oregon as well. Uh, worked my way up to where I was the uh, manager of his office here in Salem and then managed his uh, re-election campaigns too. Did you ever get sent to Washington, D.C. as part of the job, or did you basically stay uh, in, in Oregon handling the headquarters here? Basically stayed here. I went to Washington as needed for a week or two at a time, uh, but uh, the job was uh, mostly right here in Salem. Now, when you shifted to the Fronmeyer campaign, there's a shift from federal elective politics and, uh, and also representative politics, Congress, to uh, the state side. Uh, what kinds of differences did you see when you shifted? There's a lot more immediacy to what happens in state government than there is in what happens in federal government. Uh, when Congress is dealing with issues, they are of, of a, a very um, widespread and kind of global nature, and people don't see that on a day-to-day -day basis in their lives, I don't think. I think with state government, and I, I think it's true, the closer you get to the people. With local government, it's even more true because then you're dealing with issues that touch people on a daily basis. State government moves away from that a little bit, but the federal government is, is very much removed from that. I did have a taste of uh, local government uh, the other night at a neighborhood uh, uh, association annual meeting, and uh, I just sat there for a couple of hours to listen. This was not my neighborhood. I was just there as a state senator. And uh, what you're saying rings true when I think back as to what kinds of issues were being discussed. And it was more of what's the cop on the beat doing in that neighborhood. Or uh, I remember a discussion of a concern about uh, the field of vision coming out of alleys and streets and whether or not treats are, uh, the trees and bushes are trimmed back enough. Um, very local, very immediate. And I guess if you take the jump, the, the ma major jump to the federal level, we're talking about national issues. And it's, it's, uh, the focus is. Uh, much different? It, it's uh, completely different. In fact, uh, people, I think, just are, are very much removed from what's going on in Washington, D.C. And But when you get down to that local level, you get down to the state level, the local level, that's, that's affecting people um, in their pocketbook. And, and as you say, when they're driving down the street and they, they hit a pothole in the road. So uh, it's the local government officials who really don't get paid very much. Uh, put in a lot of time, and uh, I, you've really got to, to give them credit for being willing to do that. There's almost a touch of irony to this when you think about the fact that the federal government sucks more in taxes out of our citizens than do the state or local governments, and yet the immediacy of issues and concerns is much larger at that local or state level. It, it makes you wonder what would happen if we had the initiative and referendum process at the federal level like we've got it at the state level. Good observation. Well, in terms of, of what you've done working uh, for Congressman Smith, for instance, did you get into constituent concerns and those kinds of issues, or are you dealing more with policy? H how did your role play out? Generally, here in the Salem office, we dealt with constituent issues. The policy uh, discussions and work were handled in the Washington, D.C. office, so we were very much um, customer service oriented. Uh, we would go out to communities in the 5th Congressional District and make ourselves available to help people, whether it was a, a person who wasn't getting a Social Security check or somebody who was, say, a, a student who was interested in attending one of the military academies. We would work with them to, uh, to try to get their appointment to the academy. In that sense, do you see, the, we all know the representative role of members of the House and, and senators, but uh, this, this constituent concern side of it, is that sort of like being an informal ombudsman to help grease the skids to make sure government is doing its job, make sure people's problems are dealt with? Very much so. I, I think that uh, when people are having a problem with government and they need some help in solving that problem, uh, elected officials do a great job in intervening and going to an agency or, or, or something along those lines to help somebody solve a problem that they're having. Now, at the state level, my observation has been that as a senator, I've always, and as a representative in the past, I've said, well, it's my job to make sure that the agency is implementing the law and following the rules, not to put the thumb on the scales, but to make sure the scales are operating. Yeah, because sometimes some, the scales get jammed and they just aren't operating. Uh, is that your perception of it, or do you think that the legislators should be weighing in to try to say, well, you really ought to rule in favor of this constituent? I, I don't see uh, 
legislators doing that, I think you hit the nail on the head when you said it's just to make sure that the process is running smoothly. You may have a situation where a, a person working in an agency is interpreting a rule in one way uh, when there could be another interpretation that would be possible. And sometimes it helps to have uh, um, your representative step in or your senator step in and say, well, you're reading it this way, I read it this way, let's try to work through this so that we get a win-win situation and you can implement your policy, but my constituent can get the service that, uh, that they need. Now, you mentioned that uh, shifting from the federal to the state level, and we've been talking back and forth a bit anyway, you mentioned that you'd worked for a couple of members of the legislature as the staff person. Um, how is that role compared to the staff person role for a member of the U.S. Congress? Very similar, uh, because when you're working with a legislator, you're, you're trying to solve problems with state agencies. Uh, when you're working for a congressman, you're trying to solve problems with federal agencies. The, the roles are very similar, uh, both legislatively and with constituent casework. Now, your title uh, is, and you have been now for three years, legislative administrator. Can you give the, uh, the audience some idea what that job is all about? I can try. <laughs> um, we provide most of the administrative support work to the Legislative Assembly. Uh, the Legislative Branch has a variety of offices within that branch. We are one of those offices. We provide uh, payroll and accounting services. We provide uh, human resource services. Uh, we maintain all of the computer systems and the, and the television system within the Capitol. Uh, we staff legislative committees and we, we take care of the building itself from um, long-range maintenance issues and construction issues to uh, custodial work to just making sure that the uh, air conditioning works in the summer and the heat works in the winter. Now that in effect means that you're sort of the, the, the chief engineer of the train. The legislators may be deciding where the train's supposed to go, but um, you have to make sure all the wheels are working and the engines running and all of that. I, I think that the leadership would view themselves as the chief engineers and I, I would uh, agree with them on that. and. Uh, uh, we're there to help, yes, keep the train running in the right direction. As part of that, can you describe the intensity of the activity during the six months of session every couple of years as compared to the interim and, and what kind of follow-up work is done and then preparatory work for the next uh, assembly? I should mention at the get-go, of course, that our Oregon legislature is a citizen legislature. It's not in office. I mean, it's in office, but it's not in session all the time. We go into session every odd numbered year for about six or seven months, pass bills, and then we go out of session and the legislators are supposed to go to their home communities and get back to their regular jobs. Comparing in session versus out of session, what's it like in terms of what you have to do and the, and the shift in, in terms of those jobs? Well, we're busy. Legislative administration is busy the full 24 months, uh, but there are differences. Uh, during a legislative session, there are a lot more people in the building. So we open the building a little bit earlier, it stays open a little bit later. There are more issues of uh, cleaning the building and just keeping up with the daily flow through the Capitol. Uh, we view the 18 months in the interim as an opportunity to do the long-range kinds of projects that you can't do while you're dealing with the day-to-day -day activities of a legislative session. So I would say the pace picks up for those six months, uh, January through June of every odd-numbered year, uh, but uh, it, it doesn't slow down all that much during the, uh, the 18 months following that because we get right back into a cycle where we're preparing for the next legislative session. And the nature of your work in the interim then is there's been legislation passed that requires some follow-up studies or task groups or whatever else. You're working with that, but you're also then trying to ha help the committees, the interim committees, develop long-term proposals for the next session. That's right. Our committee staff work with the legislators throughout the interim. Uh, the, there are task forces and committees that meet uh, during those 18 months between sessions, and our folks are staffing those. Uh, we have issues of construction projects in the building that we cannot work on during a session, so we'll be working on those during an interim. Um, computer upgrades and just a variety of activities to, uh, to keep things moving along. As you're dealing with that whole process of construction and computer upgrades and everything else, um, you also have a different structure now. It's, it's evolved over the last few years. Uh, it seemed to me that in, years ago it was a more decentralized legislative administration structure. That's just my perception. You might correct me on that. But now we have more of an organized 
uh, I, I'll use the term almost centralized administration to make sure that we've integrated a lot of the committee functions and staff functions. Is that perception accurate or can you describe the trend that we've been through? I think that uh, there, as I said, there are a number of different offices in the legislative branch and I think we've moved more toward um, focusing on areas of strength. The legislative fiscal office is focusing its work on the budget. The revenue office focuses on tax policy. Legislative council focuses on drafting bills and amendments. And we've tried to pick up a lot of the support functions that previously existed in each of those offices so that we're the centralized administrative support function in the building. Now, John Q. Legislator. We have 60 members of the House, 30 members of the Senate. Um, in terms of the interim committee work, do you find that those uh, representatives and senators are in touch a lot with committee staff, or does it depend on the individual uh, representative or senator about the amount of activity that there is during the interim? I think you'll find that the chairs of the interim committees and task forces are in touch with staff on a, on a weekly basis or even on a daily basis as meetings are coming up and they're scheduling people to come and testify. Uh, members' uh, involvement can range from, from those folks who are talking with committee staff daily to those who have very little contact throughout the interim. Do you see or have you been in situations where you felt a little uncomfortable being wedged in, in between some policy discussions that you might feel that uh, perhaps you shouldn't be stuck in? We try to be very careful to avoid those positions because uh, we recognize that it's the elected officials who are voting on those policy issues and who should be making those policy decisions. Uh, we're there to support them and uh, whatever direction they wish to go with policy, uh, we just want to be there to provide the kind of uh, administrative support that they need to go there. One analogy that comes to mind as to that might be the uh, British government's uh, civil administration, or uh, I don't know if that's the terminology they use for their civil service, but uh, for instance, their parliament uh, relies heavily on civil servants who are professionals at the job, who are there regardless of whichever party is in control, um, and they provide the nitty gritty support, and it's, you know, yes sir, no sir, here's the information, rather than trying to get involved in the policy debate. Then there's a separate core group of legislative aides and the like who work with the members of parliament and here in Oregon the legislators on the policy issues and the development of those issues. Do we have that kind of dichotomy here in terms of your staff being the more I'll call them professionally oriented people? Um, I think we do. Uh, we, we don't refer to anyone in the Capitol as permanent staff uh, because we recognize that we're always subject to changes in the way the, the operation is structured. Uh, we refer to the, the folks who work there on a year-round basis as continuing staff and then the legislators come in for that six months and they bring in legislative aides who are much more involved in driving policy discussions and decisions. Uh, so I think that would be a, an accurate analogy. Now as to the legislators own staff, uh, uh, during the years I was a representative, during the interim I always maintained a part-time uh, assistant to help deal with constituent concerns and that sort of thing. Is that the norm or do a lot of legislators just have no staff at all during the interim? Most of the legislators have part-time staff during the interim. Uh, there are a few who don't maintain staff, but most of the folks do. As, as you know from, from being in the position, the mail continues to come in, the problems continue to come up with, with folks, and uh, I think people find that they need someone on at least a part-time basis to help with those, uh, uh, the, the details of keeping the office running. Is there any particular organizational structure that you're involved in with the leadership? Is it an informal methodology where the Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate meet with you, or is there some formal committee uh, that gets together to bring in legislative council, legislative fiscal, and the like? We have uh, formal meetings of the Legislative Administration Committee on a, a about every three months uh, the committee meets. That committee consists of the President of the Senate, the Speaker of the House, three additional senators, and four additional representatives. They set the, the um, policy direction and guidelines for what legislative administration should be doing. Uh, beyond that, there's an informal group that meets on a regular basis in the Capitol, and it's made up, up of the uh, staff directors for all the offices in the Capitol, and that's, that's fiscal, council, revenue, administration. It's the president's chief of staff, the speaker's chief of staff, uh, the 
chief clerk of the House, the secretary of the Senate, and the folks out of the caucus offices. And we meet on a weekly basis to discuss issues that uh, affect all of the offices in the Capitol. As part of that process, do you, and I'm just curious here, um, is that does that help grease the skids as far as filling in any gaps that might exist in terms of the formal bureaucracy, especially when the legislature's out of town, to make sure that people know what's going on and that uh, uh, the, the left hand knows what the right hand is doing and make sure things are better in sync? Definitely. It's, it's an information sharing opportunity uh, because what we're doing in administration is going to affect all of those offices. What the president's office wants to do or the speaker's office wants to do is going to affect all those offices. And we need to keep that communication going so that, that folks are in the loop and we can work together to accomplish the goals that are set out by the lead leadership. For my part, I've always been impressed with the, uh, well, I use the term professionalism. Uh, maybe I should say the business-like approach of, of the staff that they're there to help implement the policy uh, directives of the legislature or to help develop policy ideas of legislators, but they're not there to direct the ideas themselves. Um, have, you, have you run into problems at any time? And I'm not asking for particular war stories, but in the system, do you sometimes have to pay attention to reminding some folks that they're there uh, in a staff role, not in a policy role? Very rarely. Um, our people, I think, uh, from uh, our committee administrators to our folks who are operating the computer systems to the custodians all take their uh, professional status very seriously. Uh, they recognize that they're there to serve the 90 members of the legislature. They're not there to pursue any kind of uh, personal policy agenda. And, and we rarely run into a case where a staff member goes beyond the bounds and, and starts to advocate for or against something. Now, as we head into the next millennium, uh, there have been a lot of changes that I've observed just in the last 10 years in the legislative process. Are there particular additional changes that you foresee in terms of administration, uh, how this legislature functions that uh, we're going to need to grapple with, or are things pretty much at a steady state at this point? There's a tremendous change that is going to uh, happen this next January, and that is that we'll be in our first session under term limits. Uh, where in the past you've had senior members who have been in the legislature for uh, 12 or 14 or uh, 20 years, 25 years, those folks are all going to be gone. The most senior member of the House of Representatives this next session will be in uh, his or her third term. So a lot of the institutional memory that existed with members is going to be gone. Uh, so I think that the, the members, the leadership, are going to have to rely on staff who have been there for a long time to help them through this process where there's going to be a lot of inexperienced folks there and uh, it's, it's going to be an interesting session. I can't help but add one little piece of information to what you just said. By chance, uh, I have not been in the House of Representatives and uh, I happen to be running for re-election. This is a nonpartisan program and uh, we don't get into electoral politics here, but um, uh, uh, I've noted that if I happen to be elected to return to the House with a scant eight years of service, I will be well beyond anyone else in terms of seniority because I happen to be out for two years, so I skipped over a couple of years of term limits. But you're right, everybody else is in just their third term. That's right. That's right. And we do have one, uh, another senator who is running for the House right now. So uh, you and he, uh, assuming you're both successful, could come in and be the senior members in the House of Representatives. Does that mean I have to get rid of the rest of the dark hair that I have here? <laughs> I'll leave that entirely up to you. <laughs> well, in terms of your role then next session, do you think that your staff are going to have to provide even more assistance to legislators over time, not just next session, but as term limits has finally kicked in and we're seeing this reduced seniority, that the long view will be lost. Uh, will your staff have to help remind people of, as to where things were historically or provide more documentation? I remember when I was uh, working in the House Majority Office and I would attend some of the caucus meetings and uh, one of the members would uh, propose an idea and one of the senior members would say something to the effect of, we tried that, we did that back in 1977 and here's why it didn't work. Uh, I think all the members benefited from having that information and uh, yes, I think that the staff is going to have to be um, providing that kind of information and the kind of policy options that the members could pursue uh, so that they will have some historical context uh, as, they, 
as they address the policy issues that they're going to face. One of the things I've noted recently is that lobbyists who actually are, are feared to have more power with term limits in a sense that they're the ones who will still have a sense of history, but they also have an agenda, uh, their client's agenda, uh, might, might, you would think that they would be happy with term limits because they're supposedly going to have more influence, but they've actually routinely expressed concerns to me because um, they feel it's important for them also to know the members and to watch the members over the long haul because they develop a certain understanding of where somebody is and they're, they're, I'll call it predictability that so-and-so has these views and you get to know them. But they also know that as they help provide information to a legislator and that's assimilated by the legislator, that their education job is complete at some point, and now they're worried about having to re-educate a lot of people or educate them about their issues. Um, have you had any feedback from uh, lobbyists talking to you about, gee, what do we do now to, to get the word to legislators? I've talked with a number of lobbyists, and uh, as you know, trust is not something that just happens between two people. It takes time to build a relationship of trust where you, you feel that you can rely on information that someone is giving you. And I, I think that the term limits are going to have a tremendous impact, uh, making it more difficult for lobbyists to build that, that trusting relationship. Um, and that's going to make it more difficult for the members as well. Has there been some increased training set up for incoming members of the legislature or are there some plans afoot to try to provide some additional background information, more intense boot camp training to get them into this stuff? Yes, uh, we have historically done about two days of new member orientation following the election prior to the beginning of the session. We're looking at expanding that this year by having a, a session immediately after the election that would, would last a day. We've got a three-day session planned in December uh, to give people the tools that they're going to need to do their jobs. And then we envision continuing with orientation activities throughout the session as, as the needs arise to learn about different issues. Uh, we'll be providing that information on an ongoing basis. That will be a real challenge for you and your staff, but I appreciate the fact that you're willing to take that on. Uh, I can't help but comment, too, that I, I can reflect back to when I was a freshman member of the House back in 1989 and how I did rely on the long-term perspective and information of the, of the veterans on a number of issues. Um, and uh, not that I'm that old or anything, but uh, it makes me a little nervous that uh, if I return to the legislature, um, I'm going to have to be in a position to make sure that uh, other members understand some of that long haul. And I'd never thought about that before. It was never part of the job. You just assume there will always be enough people around who can look back and say, well, here's what's happened in 1989, uh, much less 1979. And um, uh, I guess we're all going to have to be a little bit more aware of that impact and try to make sure we don't assume that people know what was done in the past. Right, and I, I think that is a challenge that the members particular, particularly are going to face, the staff is going to face it, the, the lobbyists are going to face it, and uh, the dynamics of this session are going to be different than uh, any other session that we've been through. So it'll be an interesting process to see how it goes. Now, we only have about a minute left. If you had a chance to suggest to your kids whether or not they should get into this kind of work, what would you say to them? I would, I would encourage them completely. It's very rewarding. Um, it's something that, uh, that we need as a state, as a nation. We need folks who are willing to be involved in public service, and I would encourage them completely, I, as I would anyone. Very good. Well, I want to thank you for being on the program today. And I should mention that I never did take a break to say to our audience that you're with us on the Kevin Mannix Report. It's a little late to do that now, but if you ever have any questions or concerns, do write to me at 2003 State Street in Salem at 97301. Again, that's 2003 State Street, Salem 97301. I want to thank you all for being with us on the program, and we'll see you again next time.